Okay. All right. I think we're live here. Okay, check the. I think we're okay over here too. Maybe just a little bit. Okay. All right. Good evening. My name is Kit Sheehan. I'm the, the, the speaker, the, the teacher tonight, and I'm also the audio technician. So from time to time, I may just check my audio levels. Uh, start off with a little levity here. Uh, there's a, a website called The Language Nerds, uh, Strange Stuff About Language. And this one is apparently there is a study that says you're likely to make immoral decisions while speaking a second language. The study finds. Let's see here. The language sits deep within every one of us. It influences the way we see the world and guides how we relate to one another and to events happening around us. Studies have long shown that people who speak more than one language may unconsciously change their personality when they switch between the languages they speak. Recently, a study has shown something even more interesting disturbing. The languages we speak interfere with and direct our moral choices. The researchers from the University of Chicago have particularly shown that people are more likely to make immoral decisions when speaking a foreign language. And then it goes through the test they did, it's called the, the trolley problem. It has uh, imagined that a run, runaway trolley is careening toward a group of five people standing on the tracks, unable to move. You are next to, switch, to a switch that can shift the trolley to a different, different set of tracks, thereby sparing the five people, but resulting in the death of one who is standing on the side tracks. Do you pull the switch? And they have various parts of that, different uh, changing the different... Uh, so one got to pull the switch, and another got to save the guy on the other track. Well, <laughs> they, they set these up purposely so that... Uh, uh, I don't know if you'd seen some of the... There was the... the uh, Star Trek movie where you had the uh, uh, the scenario, the no-win scenario, and that's what the idea here is. It's a no-win. You're going to kill somebody. So what if? Uh, yeah. So, but then of course uh, James Tiberius Kirk went in and changed the software, so he passed the test. So, so. Um, so let me ask you a question. Are we saying that morality? Changes from one per one generation or one uh, of people to another. Um, well, uh, what he says essentially is that we learn morals on our first language. Uh, the things. Well, I'm asking though, does that mean that a person speaks in different morals, what? writes right what is right and wrong in different societies? No. No, it just it, because on your second language, um, you're slightly divorced from your primary, uh, where you you put your your original morals and your your worldview. And now you've got this other, other worldview that you step to one side, and and uh, that's that's what they're suggesting. Now, uh, I'm sure that this changes with different people in different situations. I don't uh, think so. Really. Uh, I don't know if with speaking Latin, does that make you holy? <laughs> If you're <laughs> well, I'm not sure. There were several popes around Luther's time that uh, they spoke Latin and that uh, didn't work so, often so well. So, uh, um, so this suggests that our mental images change when using a foreign tongue, leading to downstream consequences for how we make decisions. Um, uh, let's see here. What, uh, um, what language do you and your wife speak at home? English, uh, for the most part. Now uh, we throw in some Greek words here and there. Just like any any language, you'll have some languages that that they have uh, one word for some specific thing, and oh yeah, that's it that's it, yeah, it work comes out better in, in the foreign language. Um, uh, now. Uh, um, uh, I can't think of one right off the top of my head. So, uh, I hadn't expected that. So, yeah, 
just turn the volume down. You don't need to turn it off. Someone wants to listen. Yeah. Yeah. But, 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 but uh, there's some time. I mean, I learned a little bit of Italian and, of course, some Arabic and Greek. And um, so there's there's words here and there that, oh, that's... that's uh, now, now, of course, you get the problem that... Uh, um, yeah, you learn some languages and then some of those words when they go over to the other they mean something different so, um, so your wife de speaking to you in, in English is likely to be immoral <laughs> <laughs> well we, we figure things out uh, we've got our own we have our actually we have our own language sometimes that uh, uh, <clears throat> I mean having lived together for uh, married for 37 years I mean you, you may have the same kind of thing you've got words that mean special things um, and of course, we set up things, uh, trouble words, or things that if uh, if, if we uh, are in a, uh, a hostage situation, that we can say certain words, and we know we can communicate. Um, uh, so I think, it, I think it'd be the same thing you're speaking on. You're talking about Hebrew and Yiddish. Yeah. yeah. So those are Yiddish is some really strong words when they start speaking. Uh, when Israelis start speak, speaking Yiddish. Hmm. And you know that they're mad. <laughs> well, and I, I, I know from uh, from experience that foreigners, uh, especially Greeks, but uh, uh, other other countries as well, that uh, they feel that they uh, have really learned English when they have learned all the bad words. Uh, <laughs> my wife was. Uh, I have a, a short story which I won't repeat here over the air, um, uh, where she had uh, learned the. Uh, uh, a, a word that uh, uh, a, a, an American was getting out of a taxi cab and said something, so she had to repeat that word over and over, and and and, and until she got home, and and uh, so I'm getting ready for bed, and all she flings the door open and yells this word at me, and I'm like, uh oh, what did I do? I must have done something terrible. <laughs> okay, but what we're discussing here is not morals. Uh, well, essentially, um, uh, it may it may influence uh, decisions that you make. Um, um, that I think that's that's really what they're saying is that when you're thinking in a second language, that sometimes um, uh, you're divorced uh, slightly. It depends on how well you know that second language. If you're thinking in that language. Um, then, then, then you're, you're thinking in those words and those concepts. Um, as we've seen in, in, where in the book of Judges uh, uh, or other places that uh, the Hebrews had different ways of expressing things. Aren't we discussing concepts though but not morals? <laughs> this test was just like this so they didn't, they didn't really uh, look at the whole the, the whole category of language and how that might influence someone's thinking. They were only looking at a, at, at a moral choice based upon one specific incident. So uh, it's a limited kind of thing. It's like one of those things that you, you see on the internet. Oh, this study proves that eggs are bad for you. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, oh, how many people do they have? Oh, well, 10. Well, uh, okay. <laughs> Something like that. So this is a small study and, and, and I think uh, some of this might be tongue in cheek as well because it's a, a small study and they say, oh look at this yeah, you, you could be immoral in another language oh you know French oh we know the French oh what <laughs> so uh, and it's how they perceive the French well yeah it could be but uh, <clears throat> anyhow I'll move, move on we need to get into prayer here and um uh, um uh, and uh, um, somewhere, I, I thought I heard something. Oh, he's setting up some kind of a surgery. Phil, Phil uh, McMillan is going in some surgery this week or next week. He's looking for. A I think it's next week. Next week. I think. Yeah. So he needs. So we to need to be in prayer for Phyllis' music. Mm, yes. Severely. Oh yeah, she's probably. She, Have you heard from her? No, that's what I'm saying. She's she's still in surgery. I mean, in a hospital. But she's not and, responding. And she's not oh. responding at all. Oh. And oh. I know that. In the in the hospital. She's not responding in the hospital to anybody. Not to me. 
Herman has left several messages. Oh, and oh, she, oh, that oh, one. Oh, oh, yeah, right. that yeah, yeah. context. Yeah. No, no, no. Huh. He's left several messages, and normally she has her cell phone with her. Right. So, but she, but she hasn't responded to his messages. So just, we're just saying, just be in prayer for yes. her that everything's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been yeah. concerned. Yeah, yeah. she's, uh, um, I caught her as she was going out the door to the hospital. You know what? I had called and I caught her just as she was leaving mm -hmm. to go. The, the last time she was in the Yes. She was on her cell phone and said she answers it. She'll answer you. Call her. Who's asking? Tell us. The girl in Florida. Call her. Call her on 5 p.m. Yeah. Um, uh, I guess there's, we got a whole long list. I'm not going to go through the whole, whole list here. I don't know if uh, we, uh, just looking for, uh, uh, items of immediate concern, like, like it would say Phyllis and, uh, Phil, um, I don't know, uh, um, and here's the daughter's daughter. Oh, Karen. On the 13th, yeah. Uh, Karen, okay, she, on the 13th, she's got surgery? <laughs> Um, and we just got everybody in the, uh, I mean, like I say, we've got a long list here of, of people. Um, and uh, uh, we start with the, the, the pastors, Herman and, and, and Judith and John Hintz. Uh, he's, is he doing better now or is he doing okay right now? Doing, okay, good. Uh, so, um, Okay, well, I guess I'll just go and, I mean, we're already at 7.15 here. I'm behind schedule. But we, it was useful talking about language because that does dovetail into what we're talking about in Judges. So uh, let, me, let me go ahead and pray. Thank you, Father, for the country that we have, for the freedom that we have in this country. We pray for it. Uh, pray for the leaders that somehow you can uh, guide uh, decisions, uh, events, um, we can pray like Abraham. If there, if there are ten ten believers that uh, are walking by faith, will you save America? Actually, we need closer to a million. So, <laughs> don't know, Father, but we just pray that uh, you can uh, keep us going. Uh, pray for uh, uh, um, Phyllis. Uh, whatever her problem is, help the doctors uh, address it. Help her be be uh, relaxed and calm, and uh, seek your grace. Uh, help Phil prepare for his surgery. Um, um, help uh, Karen as she gets ready for the 13th of surgery that uh, uh, you'll be with the doctors that they can prepare and know exactly what to do and help Karen uh, relax in, in grace. Um, pray for each and every one of the members of our, our congregation uh, that, that we know that we're all in the battle um, and we need uh, support uh, uh, from you, from, from the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, pray for the, the church, uh, for, for uh, finances, for the, the children and the camp as, as they get ready for this new year, all the different things, help them raise the appropriate amount of money. Pray now, Father, for me that you'll give me words of uh, encouragement, uh, words of wisdom that I might be able to teach your word uh, faithfully. Um, Thank you, Father, for uh, uh, all these things. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Let's do uh, one more quick thing about your son. And you know that they get home okay? And if, oh, yes. And that was wrong. They were down in some place outside Florida. Okay. And one of those. But they're, little, home, but they're uh, home okay. Yeah, they're home okay. Okay. <clears throat> now, I, I'm, I'm going to obviously repeat some things from a different perspective from uh, last week, uh, but I thought it was worth um, a look at God's grace from, from the perspective of things that are said, uh, uh, starting in Judges, but uh, uh, end up, uh, whether it was in Amos or other places. Uh, so we started with uh, Genesis ten thirteen from last week. Mitzrayim became the father of Ludim and Anamim and Lebamim, Lehamim and Nebutuhim. And Pathrusim and 
Hesluhim, from which came the Philistines and Ephraim. Essentially the same words are in 1 Chronicles chapter 1. Young's literal translation, and the Pathrusim and the Kasluhim, whence have come out Philistine and the Kephtarim. And uh, uh, then I have one more. Um, uh, I have a, a, a literal translation. Uh, I don't know where I got it, but a literal translation of uh, Genesis. Uh, the Pathrusim, the Kasluhim, from whom the Philistines went out, and the Kephtarim. And my, my contention is that this is not uh, genetic, but a, a physical uh, movement. And uh, uh, the, the words here, are, you have the cane, uh, can, it usually means to go in or go, or go out, depending upon what, what uh, uh, preposition you're using. Um, it usually refers to physical movement and travel. That's where you got the preposition from, in which uh, I came across the, the word in several translation thither and i had to look it up uh i kind of think thought i knew what it was but that's an old english word i think but uh uh it means from that place or from that direction uh, so in my opinion this genealogy is interrupted to show that god interrupted history to bring the philistines out of another country that was not their own some still uh, uh some still uh say that the philistines were sons of ham but if you look at amos 9 7 here uh, are you not as the sons of Ethiopia to me, O sons of Israel, declares the Lord? Have I not brought up Israel from the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaftor and the Arameans from here? God in the book of Amos declares Israel as a paradigm of God bringing a people out of another land. By using parallelism, he says that God did the same thing, kind of thing, uh, for the Philistines and the Arameans, those who lived in Aram. Remember the comments by Jeffrey Niehaus. The Lord will disabuse Israel of any sense of specialness. As his covenant people, they were special, but he opens their eyes to the fact that he has brought other people from one land to another, and he has enabled other people to conquer the inhabitants of those new lands and settle in their place. Indeed, he's even fought for those people just as he fought for Israel and Canaan. The only difference between Israel and the Philistines, the Ethiopians and Aramean, is that Israel had entered into a covenant relationship with the Lord. Much was expected of them because the Lord had given them much. But Israel had broken the covenant and for that reason had become profane in the Lord's eyes, page 3, was now considered to be no better than the accursed descendants of Ham. Are you not like Cushites to me, O Israelites? God's grace has been hidden in plain sight right before our eyes. Just because Israel is God's chosen people doesn't mean he ignores the rest of the world. God is active everywhere and at all time. Look at the story of Jonah. The entire city was on the verge of going positive toward God. So he sent Jonah. I call him a hesitant evangelist. He might have been uh, um, uh, 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 trying to run from being an evangelist. He, apparently he didn't like the, uh, the uh, Ninevites. Ninevites. Once, but once Jonah realized he could tell the citizens of Nineveh that unless they believed in the God of Israel, they were all going to die and go to hell. And, and Jonah says, I'm all in. That's right. From the king on down, they repented and believed. Jonah was displeased. We're not the people of Nineveh, wicked people, but faith in the living God can change that. So look at our Amos 9 verse again. Consider it over and over again in Judges. God reminds the sons of Israel, as he does in Amos 9, that he brought them out of Egypt. But he did similar actions for the Philistines and the Arameans. And where did Ammon and Moab come from? Lot. And God brought Lot and his two daughters out of Sodom before he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So back to our judges verse. Um, that then the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, served the Baals, the Ashtoreth, and gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of sons of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines. Thus they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. Of the peoples mentioned, God intervened on the part of Aram, Moab, Ammon, and Philistia. There may be a story for Sidon, but I'm not sure. Uh, I, I don't know if there is one or not. But they had, they'd all turned against God, so now Israel turned against God. And they have become even more corrupt than the people that are around them. So why would they think they could escape the wrath of God? Yet over and over again, the Jews think exactly that. Uh, remember a verse from Romans chapter 2. Paul had been setting up the Jews who were thinking they were so much better than the Gentile Goy. Then he says, Therefore you have no excuse. Every one of you who passes judgment, 
For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. There's an application to the United States. Where did many of the original Americans come from? From England, who was prosecuting many. So God brought them out one by one from England, Scotland, and Ireland, and other places. Because these immigrants trusted God and wanted a place of freedom to worship God and earn an honest living. God responded. We are now in danger of losing that freedom because so many citizens have rejected the true living God. We have become a corrupt, evil nation in some respects, just like the sons of Israel in the book of Judges. Yet there are still believers. But are there enough to save the country? Like I said in the prayer, maybe we'll ask like Abraham, uh, if there are ten believers, will you save the city? Here's the point. God responds to the smallest amount of faith. Uh, just because things are bad, we don't run from God, we don't hide. Um, we turn to God and, and, and say, we trust you. We don't, we don't know what's going to happen, we, but we know that, that you will bless us because we are trusting you. Uh, praise be the God, the character of, of, of God. Now back to our, our passage in Judges chapters 10, going back to uh, Judges 10, 7. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the sons of Ammon. Um, uh, I've, I, uh, I'm bringing in, like last week, I, I, I quoted a lot from uh, Robbie Dean. This week I'll, I'll uh, quote a lot from this commentary uh, from, by Trent Butler. Um, uh, it just has some, some neat things. I had a couple of them I hadn't thought of, but I hadn't realized. But uh, So some of this is kind of interesting. Some of it's a little long. but <clears throat> So here's the first comment. The Bible consistently pictures God as an emotional person who reacts to the choices his people make. Now, we, we know this is anthropomorphic, anthropopathism, um, uh, it, it making up God to have uh, human characteristics so we can understand what he's doing from, from a human perspective, knowing all along that, that he's um, uh, unchangeable. Uh, but uh, he acts in history, so that's how they characterize it in the Bible. Anger is a faithful response to Israel's rejection. All efforts to erase divine anger from Scripture fail because God's anger continues to reappear in Torah, history, poetry, prophets, apocalyptic uh, uh, gospels, letters, and, and the apocalypse. Anger leads God to sell Israel into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites, each of whom made a cameo appearance in chapter 3 and will take center stage in what follows. Jephthah will deal with the Ammonites and, and, and Samson with the Philistines. The God of Salesman image comes again from the early framework, having been used only once since 4-9. Uh, uh, Thus, 10-6-7 reinforces the opening framework and show that its warnings remain in effect for disobedient Israel. Uh, there's a uh, a little one of these things on Facebook uh, it's like a, uh, a sign in a library uh, the apocalyptic fiction has been moved to current events <laughs> I, almost, I was going to post that but, <laughs> but sometimes you wonder hey this is we're getting close <laughs> Judges 10.8 they afflicted and crushed the sons of Israel that year for 18 years they afflicted all the sons of Israel who were beyond the Jordan and Gilead in the land of the Amorites. There's uh, an issue here with syntax. I'm not going to deal with it. I'm just going to take the, uh, uh, some translators have problems. Is it, is it uh, the 18th year was, was uh, we'll just take it the, the way we got it in the New American Standard. <clears throat> and there's the, 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 uh, the map. I've added something to the map. Uh, you see that uh, uh, a red rectangle and I've got a, a Gilead off to the right with an arrow pointing to the red so that you know that that general area is of course Gilead's not a, not a rectangle but I just that it was easy to just mop that in there so you know the general it's on the east side of the Jordan but the people that were there uh, come across to the uh, the west side um, so Gilead and, and what I did is I used uh, Merrill Unger's description to make that little little uh, Rectangle. <clears throat> for Mara Unger, the mountain region east of the Jordan, called the Mount of Gilead, extending from the Sea of Galilee to the upper end of the Dead Sea, about 60 miles long and 20 miles wide. Afflicted and crushed, one commentator, Robert Chisholm, he's the uh, professor at DTS, 
says that the two verbs used to describe the Ammonites' treatment of Israel sound the same in Hebrew. He continues, the repetition of sound and the movement from the basic verbal stem, the cow, to the emphatic or re repetitive, the poel stem, emphasizes the severity of Israel's defeat. So you've got two words that sound similar, except one's in a stronger form uh, of a verb, meaning uh, it's getting worse. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, the crushed, uh, the word for crushed there is, is only used here in Exodus 15:6. Uh, uh, thy right hand, O Jehovah, has become honorable in power. Thy right hand, O Je Jehovah, doth crush an enemy. And over and over again in Judges, you see words that are used uh, uh, of God protecting Israel are now used against Israel because they're, they're hostile towards God. They have uh, abandoned him. <clears throat> so the point here is the affliction and crushing are intensive. You know that phrase, it can't get any worse, and then it did. Well, that's what happens here. <clears throat> so it got worse for the sons of Israel. They really, really, really hurt. That was what God had to do in order to get their attention. Uh, afflicted. Uh, we've talked about this. The verb occurs frequently in the basic cow stem, but only rarely in the peel or poel for chism. Again, God reserved some really tough times for the sons of Israel in order to get their attention. And so God does the same for believers who, are, who continue out of fellowship. We know that from the New Testament. Uh, God, uh, um, uh, as some pastors say, he needs a two by four by the uh, between your ears <laughs> to get your attention. And sometimes we we've probably all been there. God got us. Uh, I, I mentioned one time as an early uh, a new believer, understanding uh, 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 being in uh, faith rest. But I w I know that I was thinking something that wasn't exactly right. And all of a sudden, I tripped and fell on, flat on my face. And, oh, I know why I'm down here. <laughs> okay, got it, God. So God gets us. Yeah, God's got to do it to all of us. <clears throat> uh, and so in the middle there, page 7, and so God does the same for believers uh, who continue out of fellowship, worshiping something other than God. <coughs> success, popularity, and on, on you on and on with the different lists. Judges 10.9, the sons of Ammon crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah, Benjamin, and the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was greatly distressed. Uh, remember that Ammon and Moab were sons of Lot, Abraham's nephew. Cross the Jordan. Uh, I mentioned, I, don't, I think I may, may have mentioned this last week or the week before, crossing a river has historically been an important event, uh, and we talk about different people who crossed the uh, 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 river. You had Abraham cross the river, and some people say that that's where Hebrew comes from, crossing. Um, or, and, or you've got Caesar crossing the Rubicon, or General Patton crossing the Rhine. And since this is January, we're all we're a few few days away from January 10th. Let me read this from National Geographic's website. On January 10th, 49 B.C., General Julius Caesar entered Roman territory by crossing the Rubicon a stream in what is now northern Italy. In crossing the Rubicon, Caesar began a civil war that signaled the end of the Roman Republic. So often uh, crossing crossing a river is, it, is some historical event. <clears throat> to fight. This verb is, a, in the, is reflexive. It emphasizes the interest of the Ammonites to do this. But there is perhaps an implied irony here because this word is used in Exodus where God is a promise to the Israelites. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. There's that word fight. Except here, God's keeping silent. All, everybody's backwards. God's keeping silent while the, the Ammonites beat up on the sons of Israel. It's, again, it's, uh, I think that uh, uh, Samuel or whoever wrote the, the book of Judges had a sense of humor. And, and so there's a lot of little things uh, like this throughout the, uh, the book of Judges. Uh, that uh, um, just shows that things are upside down and backward, but he, he laughs at it at the same time sometimes. Um, and, and the problem, again, is lack of faith in the living God. And we know, uh, as the commentary in, in Hebrews, uh, chapter 3, <clears throat> For who provoked him, God, when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, 
whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Therefore, let us fear, while a promise remains of entering his rest. Any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. So you, you, you have faith, rest, the walk by faith, the doctrine plus faith. Uh, you, you have the promise from God, and you trust God for that promise. Now, there's an interesting part here, because it, it mentioned Judah, Benjamin, and the house of Ephraim. And I and, uh, uh, don't know if those were just uh, the, the only ones affected by the, the Ammonite invasion, or, <clears throat> or uh, Samuel had a specific mind, uh, a thought in mind. And here's the possibility by Trent Butler. His quote, the editorial note here mentions each of the three tribes more for what is to come than for what has already occurred. But it appears to be no accident that precisely these three tribes are represented in this book dealing so strongly with leadership, for they represent the three sources of monarchs for Israel. The Davidic dynasty in Judah, okay, the short-lived rule of Saul from Benjamin, and the disastrous rule of Jeroboam from Ephraim. Um, and I'm not going to go into the background of that, but I thought that was interesting that you have the uh, three kings and each one from a different uh, different tribe. Uh, greatly distressed. There's a, possibly a play of words here in the Hebrew. That, uh, that there is a verb meaning to shape or form as in a part of making something. It was sometimes used uh, uh, of the Israelites as they make idols. You know, the kind of sons of, the, of Israel were, were, were worshipping. The, the verb here could be from that verb root, for Jesenius. He, he includes that uh, sometimes they have two, uh, uh, two different verbs that have the same triliteral. So you sometimes say uh, Roman numeral one for the first one and Roman numeral two for the second one. And other books, they, 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 they point to a different verb. Um, Either way, there is a potential play in words because of the similarities in the word forms. The sons of Israel are in a very distressful situation uh, because they fashioned like a potter the idols that they worshipped. The author of the book of Judges, whether that was Samuel or someone else, had a lot of humor and great insight. Combined, you get divine humor. Uh, Judges 10.10 10. Then the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord, saying, We have sinned against you, for indeed we have forsaken our God and served the Baals. The sons of Israel cried out, Once again they sin. Once again they are in divine discipline. Once again they cry out to the Lord. But apparently they were crying out while holding the idols in their hand. Later we'll see them, they put them away. Uh, there's another place where where I think it was with Josh. I was going to have a, have a little... Uh, uh, thing from home and say, yeah, my, my idol here, but I didn't. I forgot to bring it. But uh, but but, we, but we've seen that that uh, 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 that uh, sometimes when they're they're yes, we that we're gonna have uh, faith in Yahweh, and and uh, okay, we'll put all your idols away. Oh, okay. Uh, so um, I, I can remember uh, uh, in a foreign land or in a. Uh, the exercise in the military, we we were a place where where the local populace was not allowed to have alcohol, um, but we were allowed to go to a an NCO club and and have beer, and, but we were supposed to drink it there and not take it back to the tents. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there was one guy that uh, that had uh, brought a can back and someone caught him, and he said, uh, uh, "You're not allowed to have the beer." How did that get there? <laughs> well. <Wow. laughs> <laughs> so how did that get in my hand <laughs> throw that idol away but something that uh, I don't know if I put it here um, uh, uh, it, it says here they, they put them away and, and uh, I, somewhere here I, uh, I think I make a comment that uh, they shouldn't have put them away they should have destroyed them but by putting them away they put them on the shelf or something well, they're still there, so when the, after the, this is all cleared up, then they'll go back and uh, they'll take those out. <clears throat> Trent Butler again. Now, I've got a little little OBJ in, a, in, in uh, dotted lines. That was the Hebrew. It didn't copy over very well. 
For the only time in the book, the people of, es of Israel confess their sin, defining sin precisely as the narrator described it in verse 6, abandoning God, not worshiping or serving him, and worshiping or serving the vows. Note here again the plural vows, you know, in varied worship of vow at different sanctuaries and possibly under different titles, such as the vow of Berith and Shechem. Later, Jephthah, Jephthah will use the term, the Hebrew word, to talk about missing the mark in international relations. And the term will be used in its technical meaning of missing uh, the mark in archery. Uh, I, I, I probably mispronounced it. I think it's chata, something like that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I, I'm familiar with that word from the Arabic cognate. I can remember when I was in Arab class, if you had a quiz and we'd write down the answers, and if the if I got an answer that was wrong, the the, 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 the teacher would say khata, that was wrong, incorrect. So that's what uh, what they're talking about here. Uh, it was incorrect. Um, next page eleven. <clears throat> Looks like I may finish early. The Lord said to the sons of Israel, Did I not deliver you from the Egyptians, the Amorites, the sons of Ammon, and the Philistines? Also, when the Sidonians, the Amalekites, and the Maonites oppressed you, you cried out to me, and I delivered you from their hands. Uh, so, once again, God has to remind them, uh, look, I've, I've been doing this a long time, and you keep getting in trouble, and i got to bail you out. You keep in trouble, and i got to bail you out. Uh, uh, so, you know, here's Trent Butler again. Here, if we follow... Uh, uh, the Masoretic text, we have a clear case of the narrator apparently knowing historical information that's no longer preserved for us. He's talking about the Mayonites. Not mayonnaise I sorry. <laughs> Mayonites. There's a reference to a guy that associates the name with the Meonites, who are at home in the same region as the Midianites and may even have been a confederate or, or dependent group. Um, We've encountered before the, the, the fact that it's obvious that uh, uh, writers of scripture are familiar with things that weren't mentioned before. Um, um, isn't there something in, in Jude about the body of Moses? Uh, um, Michael the Archangel uh, was uh, fighting against Satan for the body of... Uh, so we say, well, that's not in Exodus or, or, or Deuteronomy or any place there. Um, but he is in scripture uh, in Jude, and that's uh, um, um, uh, scripture. That, but and there's other things that we come across, and and so we know that there was an oral tradition. But God wrote down what we needed. Um, uh, there's a movie, the uh, the Matrix, where where uh, one of the actors goes in to see the Oracle, and he comes out, and the guy says. She only told you what you needed to know. And he, he, she didn't tell him everything that was going to happen. And, and, and so the, what the Bible is what we need to know. Um, and uh, now we can put <coughs> piece things together and, and come up with uh, uh, things that might not be specifically said. Uh, for instance, the, the date of the, uh, of the Great Flood was apparently the same, same year as when Methuselah died. Uh, that uh, uh, Genesis Five or six, I mean, yeah, I call it God's spreadsheet. Five. Um, so uh, you put it; it's almost perfectly worded to just take it and put it in a spreadsheet. And you get the spreadsheet, and you look up and say, "Hey, the the day that uh, the year that Methuselah died, that's the same year as the flood." And of course, there's a, there's a play on on the name of Methuselah. Some people translate it after this; it will happen. Um, so when he dies, it will happen. So yeah, happens. something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so you you can uh, uh, learn things from from just the logic uh, of of the passage. But there are some things that well, I, and I have talked about them over and over again in the Book of Judges. I, I want to know this, but it's not said, and and this and this. Well, uh, like John said, if God if God put everything in in the Scripture. Uh, in, in talking about Jesus and his miracles in, in the book of John, he, the, the books in the whole world wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, take, uh, wouldn't be able to cover it. So God has to focus on what our little brains can, can soak up. Um, so, uh, but, but when we get to heaven, God will have, maybe we'll have big brains this big. I don't know. <laughs> we'll have to have a lot of, a lot of brain power to, to, yeah, uh, 
soak up the additional information. Yeah. Judges 10, 13. You have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will no longer deliver you. I will no longer deliver you. Oops. What did we do to, 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 to get to that point? <clears throat> so they cried to the Lord for forgiveness while clinging to their idols. You can tell God you sinned all day long. But if there's no change of mind, if you continue to sin, what is what use is it to confess your crime? It's like going to a bank to rob it and saying to God, I sinned, but you do the robbery anyhow. Well, so uh, you got to have a change of mind, something, a repentance, something in your in your mind that says, oh, yep, yeah, that's wrong. I'm not going to do it. Uh, I'll trust in God. But if you go ahead and sin anyhow, well... So that's the point here. Is there, is there, are they just saying it, uh, 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 um, or is there, or is there really a, a change of mind? So, so uh, Judges ten fourteen. Go cry out to the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver in the time of your distress. It reminds me of uh, of some of the the tests between the uh, Yahweh and the the idol gods. Um, was it? Uh, um, Gideon, um, where um, uh, was it? Gideon, I can't. I'm trying to remember now who it was that. Uh, uh, but there, there were there were other other. Uh, I guess it was Elijah, Elijah, or Elisha, uh, where he's got this thing and uh, they pour water on his sacrifice and uh, how is this going to burn? Uh, and and uh, and and similar with the with the. Uh, Gideon's test of, uh, of God, that uh, God did a, a miraculous things. Um, but the, their gods uh, didn't do anything because they're not, they're not real gods. They, what's behind them are, are demon worship. Um, but uh, so God says, well, you're holding on to these, these idols, so as soon as you get done here, you're going to go worship them. So I, I'm, I'm going to wait uh, and tap my foot a little bit longer here until you, I get your attention, your full attention. Not just, oh yeah, God, we need your help. And and uh, um, so why did the sons of Israel cry out to the living God? Somehow they realized that he was the only one that could deliver them. So an obvious question is then, why do they keep on returning to their idols and false gods, in which in, in reality is demonism? Lack of faith resulting in slavery to the sin nature. They're... they're, they're here they are. I mean, the, the logic of this. I mean, you see it on TV today uh, with uh, different politicians. Uh, they say one thing, and you say that doesn't make any sense, uh, and neither does this. If they they know that God is is the one that's delivering them, so why go to any other God that's not going to deliver? Them? Like God says, if you think they're so good, go to them and have them deliver you. Oh well, they can't deliver. Well, then don't go back to them. But they keep on going back to them. Uh, and that's again lack of faith. We, uh, if we're out of faith, uh, we're we're being uh, controlled by the sin nature. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so uh, the uh, Judges ten fifteen. So then, the sons of Israel said to the Lord, "We have sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you. Only please deliver us this day." Uh, okay, we're really really sorry for what we did now. <laughs> Whatever seems good to you. Okay, translation, but it obscures a play on words yet to come. Um, and the sons of Israel say unto Jehovah, We have sinned. Do thou to us according to all that is good in thine eyes. Only deliver us, we pray thee, this day. So you've got all that is good in thine eyes. Ding, ding, ding. Isn't that uh, in a different different words the, the, the same, the theme of this of this. Uh, 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 book Judges, uh, page thirteen, uh, tw Judges twenty one twenty five. We hadn't gotten there yet. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes, not in God's eyes, in his own eyes. Same thing in Judges seventeen six. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. Yet in Judges ten fifteen, they know that God is in charge and he needs to do what is right in his eyes. And so at some point they come back and realize that, well, this is the truth. And then why, why abandon God later on to gods that can't do anything? And it, it, from, now, 
we're walking by faith so we can see that. Um, and the same thing with uh, these, these uh, uh, fill in the blanks politicians, because <laughs> um, they're on TV, that they say things and you say, that doesn't make any sense. That's not true. Yes. Now in the book of Judges, what is the significance of there was no king in Israel as opposed to just talking about Jehovah? Well, well we, we get the answer to that in, in 1 Samuel. Uh, when, uh, when the people want a king, a physical king, and, and God answers and says, okay, give them a king because they have rejected me as Instead their king. king. And, and that's the point is that God is supposed to be their king. Um, they have this great, great freedom where they have no, no central government that, uh, uh, that controls them, taxes them. I mean, they've got certain taxes that they, by the, the Torah, but, uh, um, uh, they don't have to, there's a lot of things they don't have to, to do. They have great freedom, but they've abused it because God is supposed to be their king. Uh, but the problem is that they, over and over again, unless they have a physical human leader, they seem to not be able to do that. Um, they can't uh, keep God as their king. They need to see something. The same with, uh, with the gods. They have to have idols, something they can hold and see. But God, you can't see uh, unless you have the, the, the angel of the Lord. Uh, but he doesn't, he doesn't go around evangelizing everybody. Um, he just uh, is there for special, special occasions. And you're supposed to walk by faith. But um, um, So here we go in, uh, in Judges 10, 16. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord. Oh, so all of, up until this point, they still had those idols in their hands, clinging to their idols. Uh, so uh, God could bear the misery of Israel no longer. At least in this case here, okay, they put their idols away. They didn't destroy them, so they're coming back another day. We know that. Um, uh, so the but the, the verb in this context means to put away, to put aside, to remove. It's causative because of the threat of continued suffering. They did this, but notice what they did not do. They did not destroy them. If they buried them in their backyard, backyard, they still have the option of digging them up and returning to Baal worship. They should have destroyed them. And in, and when you get to the the and the the, the uh, uh, I'm forget, I, I didn't put it in here. In Deuteronomy, uh, there's instructions to destroy all the idols of the, the, the nations around you. And then when the kings, the good kings, uh, whether that's uh, Josiah, Jehoshaphat, or uh, um, some of those, uh, um, Hezekiah, where they go out and they destroy the, the, the high places and the idols and so on. Um, uh, but that's the point. Destroy, get rid of them completely. If you just have them sitting out there, they become a, a temptation uh, because your sin nature says, oh, wouldn't you really like to worship this idol? Uh, and, uh, and now we have the same temptations, whether uh, we, we don't have idols of, of uh, silver and gold and metal and wood and so on, but we have, uh, um, um, oh, the Joneses next door got a new car. Oh, I need a new car. Um, so you, you worship uh, success or, or wealth or different things. And uh, my wife and I sometimes talk about some of the, the movie stars who have uh, huge amounts of wealth and how many wives or husbands have they had. And uh, they're obviously, uh, some of them are on drugs or booze. And, and it's just, well, why would I want so much money? All I need is, is, is God and I have happiness and I take my happiness with me because um, I can walk by faith. But they have nothing. And, and so sometimes you want to, yeah, you say, well, put me on an airplane with him, sit next to that guy, and I'll give him the gospel or something. Well, God can do that with somebody else. And in some cases, there are, are, are actors that are believers. Um, and, and some of them have said, said some amazing things, um, um, making you think that some of them are, are, are believers. But uh, um, was it Willie Nelson? He was a believer. But, but even so there you have even believers when they get uh, tied up in that, that culture, uh, just like the, 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 the people in the book of Judges. Uh, they get in this culture and uh, they get uh, involved in it. And for some reason it's attractive. And so they go down that path and they forget who God is. But uh, I guess Willie Nelson's in, in heaven. He died, right? No, he. Oh. No, he's still. He's, he's still, still alive. Oh, okay. I thought he died. 
I'm going to say you should. <laughs> <laughs> Still hanging in there, huh? So, so uh, um, <laughs> yeah. Well. So anyhow, I guess. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Some of these. Uh, uh, we'll just need the uh, God's grace. Uh, there's nothing else that's going to save us. Um, and sometimes you see little glimmers here and there. I mean, you've got uh, um, Ron DeSantis in California, in For uh, Florida. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that little little uh, thing on the back of somebody's car. Um, uh, for all you woke people or something, I forget. I don't. I remember the exact wording now. Uh, but for all you woke people, uh, you, you go go back to wherever you came from. You'll be happier, and so will we. <laughs> so I can't remember the exact thing. Now they got somebody that they're, they're investigating who put that sign out. Uh, <laughs> So, in Texas, and he, they put bumper stickers that says "Remember why you left before you left." Oh yeah. yeah. Well, there was somebody <laughs> vote Republican. Uh, somebody that uh, looked at the people that were going into to Florida, and they said that that a, a large portion of those people are actually conservatives that have left California, New York, and and so on. I don't know, but I mean, our 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 our. Uh, reply to or our version of that was don't california my texas yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh we, we like the conservative uh perspective here and um but uh, uh too many people have uh, abandoned god and um and uh, what was it uh i was listening to uh um Robbie Dean and there's a, there was a movement in the Christian uh, circles of uh, uh, something theism. Um, uh, essentially, uh, 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 denying the, uh, uh, the the things about the Bible. I guess uh, I have to I have to go back and, and listen to that. It was just uh, some of these things you you hear. Well, I, I mean, I've heard. Uh, there was a Methodist, First Methodist, or one of the Methodist churches down in Dallas, where they had joint services with Muslims. Um, and, yeah, yeah, that was a few years ago. But uh, I mean, I, I what? Um, it, uh, churches. Well, that's that, the movement that's the emergent where they're emerging. Yeah, the yeah, yeah the emerging church, the Chrislam, yeah. and so yeah. on, and uh, mm -hmm. it's just uh, and and the lady that was there says, "Oh, you know that the that the Arabs." believe that uh, Jesus was a prophet? Well, my response was, yeah, but they don't think he was God. Well, right. uh, and, uh, oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, so, so was Muhammad. Yeah, yeah exactly. so, so uh, it's a challenging time. Um, and and uh, uh, whether the, uh, I mean, I've talked about the vocabulary previously that uh, some words that meant one thing when I was a child mean something totally different today. And uh, people are trying to change the, the vocabulary and, and what it means and um, whether that's racism or, or uh, it's just uh, it's, it's hard to keep up with what people want to do but well, what I like the, lang the English language the way it was yeah you have to assimilate some new words for technology but let's not change the culture based just to uh, uh, our gender yeah, or well yeah that's a uh, but I like this, it says everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Yes. And that's exactly yeah. what's happening now. Everyone yeah. is doing what's right in their own eyes. Exactly, yeah. So Judges is a book for our time. Mm -hmm. Any any other questions before I close the prayer? Okay, well, I'm only five minutes early, so. <laughs> Thank you, Father, for today. Thank you for your word, that we can study it and we can... Uh, admire it worship uh, through your word uh, you you, you uh, educate us uh, help us understand who and what you are your character uh, that we we approach to you through faith uh, trust in in who and what you are uh, we're, we ask father that this message go out uh, people can understand it and they can apply it to their own lives and and Help them to understand the importance of, of the, the veracity uh, of, of the word and how it's so coherent that everything flows together. Um, uh, 
So thank you, Father, for it's in Christ's name we pray. And uh, just kind of a, lot, a last minute uh, uh, thing is I'll be teaching, uh, I guess there's a, a vacancy for teaching on Sunday morning first service. So I volunteered to teach that. And uh, there's a book, uh, do I have it here? Yes, I do. Um, uh, it's called Is Atheism Dead? Um, uh, but uh, well, that but the, the, the idea is uh, there we go. Let's see here. Is Atheism Dead? Uh, by Eric Metaxas. Uh, I found it uh, fa fascinating, and I, I will kind of on Sunday morning uh, go through as a partly as a book report, book review, but I would like to uh, connect it up to the Bible. Um, essentially, Eric Metaxa looks at five topics that, to a certain extent, undermine the atheist position. Uh, one of those being the Big Bang Theory. It used to be that uh, uh, scientists thought that the, the Earth, that, that the universe had always existed, and so that for, for Darwinism, where they needed lots and lots of time of of uh, chemicals interacting with uh, lightning and other stuff. Um, and, uh, uh, well, the Big Bang Theory says, well, there's only, the, Earth, the, the, the universe has only been around for 15.8 billion dollar, uh, years. Um, there are other things, that, the complexity, uh, what did he call that? Uh, um, um, any, yeah, but essentially, fine-tuning. Used to be that there was the what, what do they call that the intelligent design? Well, that that had some some shortcomings, so they came up with uh, fine tuning. The idea is that uh, more and more items are being discovered. That well, if this constant, this mathematical constant, uh, physics in physics was changed by just a little bit, life couldn't exist on the earth. And and this used to be just you needed to, uh, you know, like the uh, certain uh, planet with certain couple of things and, and then that's all you needed for life so then there should be uh, millions of planets like earth well then you start coming up well it needs to have this and it needs to have this and it needs to have that um, people are still saying well if there's water then there could be life well but there are a lot of different things that need to and so you've got this complexity and there are some people that were atheists I guess uh, Whitaker Chambers was he the guy that uh, looked at his his daughter's ear and just saw the, all the folds and that, uh, the complexity of that? How can that be? Um, there are other people that, that looked at other other things in the universe and and saw the complexity of it. How can that not be a design? Something that was intentionally done that way. And when he said that, he said, "I cannot I cannot continue this thinking any yeah. longer. If I keep going." Yeah. I'll end up with God. Yeah, and he eventually did. Yeah. So, and there are other people, uh, the same thing that, uh, um, oh well, uh, and then there's the, the Bible. Um, uh, there, if there are, um, uh, there are a number of people, uh, and I know one in particular, that was uh, anti-Christian, anti-Bible, so someone challenged him, take something in the book, uh, in the Bible, and prove that it's wrong. Then you've got your case. But just to just to throw rocks at it, well, and so so uh, this guy that I knew took the book of Daniel, uh, and and so he went through and eventually he realized it's true, and what it is, it's what it says it is, and 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 from the time he figured that it was what it said it was until he believed in Christ, he said he felt like he was living in hell because he knew the truth, but he he didn't want to leave his drugs and other stuff in, in his his uh, non Christian life. Um, but he knew, and so just, and then there's other people. Uh, one of the, uh, the guys at the uh, um, uh, pre-trip conference, the, the, the Jewish guys that became Christians, um, I don't know if that's Michael Redelnik or there was another guy, um, that his mother became a Christian. Frickenbaum or something like that. Yeah. Frickenbaum. Yeah. Huh? Frickenbaum. Yeah. Ah, ah. Uh, Fruchtenbaum, yeah. Yeah, Fruchtenbaum. That, uh, that, so he went in to prove that, that, uh, that the, the New Testament, the Gospels were wrong, and he ended up becoming a believer because going to the, the Bible, it's true. 
and and that was that's another so there's a number of things that they go through in this book the part that i really enjoyed uh, and i haven't read the whole thing i've, I've had to skip through parts of it because I, I needed to to put this thing together for for uh, sunday um, is the part on archaeology that there are there are people that were liberals um, and didn't, didn't necessarily believe the bible is the inspired word of god necessarily but they had not they had found nothing in all the archaeology that they'd done that that uh, uh, contradicted what the Bible said, um, and and uh, so it's the proof test for archaeology. Oh yeah, if it's in the Bible. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, and I I had a book I think the 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 Bible is my guidebook or something like or my map something like that, um, and uh, um, so anyhow he goes through a number of things and I thought that was fascinating so I thought I would write something down and then I try. And, and connect those, like the Big Bang Theory, you go to Genesis 1-1, and the problem is that today you have uh, a pagan society that that uh, um, you can't say, are you saved? We've, we've had this discussion before in this class. Is you can't, uh, in the 50s, you'd say, are you saved? And people say yes or no. They knew what you meant. Well, now, the, the, when you talk about God, they don't even know who God is. Um, or, or our parents don't teach people uh, uh, the Bible stories, and so they they have no clue what's in the Bible. So I remember one little girl came up to me one day, well, a teenager. Uh, Do you know anything about the Bible? Didn't ask. Do you know anything about God? Do you know anything about the Bible? And so we sat down and I gave her the gospel. I uh, don't know if that had an effect or not, but uh, that's the problem: is they don't have, they don't they don't know. They aren't taught. There, there's that we've lost that in our culture. Our culture has abandoned God like they did in, in uh, Judges. Uh, anyhow, I, I, I'm starting to preach like I'm going to preach on, the, on Saturday morning or Sunday morning. Uh, I've, I've already said the prayer, so we're done. You're just dismissed.